Hello, welcome back to the workshop and welcome to the fourth and final in my series of camping projects. Today I'm going to make a knife, a folding knife, it's going to be loosely based on the Sford from New Zealand. There's a picture of one. And rather handily, the photo I found is has translucent handle scales because the bit I'm going to be copying is this folding mechanism. I don't feel bad about copying their design because it's ancient, I mean centuries and centuries old. It's not going to be a direct copy of this forward because I'm going to use my own blade shape, um, one that I've come to over the years. And I, this is the final version and this is what I use for, this is a carving knife and I use this for making spoons and all sorts. This is what I started off with and it's, <laughs> it's embarrassingly crude to look at now but at the time um, yeah, I was pleased with it and it is functional. But when I was doing carving, I realized that more and more I wasn't using the whole length of this blade. Um, I was only using about that much. So then I started making the carving knives like this. And like I say, eventually I ended up with this, with the sort of fatter belly to it. This then is the evolved shape for carving knives. For me, I find this a really useful shape. So what I'm gonna try and make today is basically a folding version of this. So I have made a folding knife before, this is it, and it's okay for what it is, but the thing with this, the retaining mechanism is just this this ring, it's actually just a bit of copper pipe, that slides around and it retains it fairly well, but it's not particularly secure, it's not a particularly strong setup if you're trying to do whittling or whatever. The advantage of the knife that I'm gonna try and make is that it's got a, a tang to it rather than just ending there in the in the middle on the pivot and the tang when you hold it your hand pins the tang and it is actually quite secure even though it's not a locking mechanism these are the blanks that i was using for making these knives so <laughs> they're all the old ones this is the current blade shape so i'm going to use this as a pattern and I've just got to work out the tang, which I'm going to, like I say, copies from the board. So I've just traced their design, and then I've gone over it with my own master here to get the blade shape. This is the bit that I really need to copy, this geometry here. So this is going to be a pivot screw and a stop pin. So when you open up the blade, the tang pushes against that stop pin and that's where your hand wraps around and grips it tight. So this tang, what I'd, what I'd kind of like to do, instead of just having a sort of snub on the end with a hole in it, as, as per this, I'd like to scroll it up. <laughs> we'll see. This then is going to be forged. Um, what they do for the handle scales is have two separate scales and I think a spacer in between them and it all bolts together with these two bolts. I might go with that but what I'm going to try and do is make it out of one piece of wood. Make the handle out of one piece um, with a slot cut in the middle. And then I wouldn't need that one, I'd only need this one here which you can control a friction, a friction folder, so you control the friction by doing up this bolt that's here. So I just need a bolt and a single pin and nothing at that end. So I'm going to try that. Um, let's get some materials. I've got here a box of old files. And I think something in here is going to be ideal. And the rest, <laughs> I'm sure I can find it from bits and bobs lying around. So something like that, it's obviously the spine on that's massive. I don't want to spend all day forging it down. That's a bit closer. So it's not quite wide enough, but by the time I've forged it a bit, I can increase it that way. I've got to take, yeah, a fair amount off of. That's a goer. Yeah, so we still need some hardware for the pivots and things. I've been trying to find some brass pins to use for the pivot, but <laughs> these are all just plated. 
that, of course, actual brass is non-magnetic. These look brass. Let's have a... They are brass. So these are brass, but they've got um, posi drive heads, which uh, yeah, that'd be all right. But I'd like something. It's, yeah, just it'd look a bit more classy if it was just a, a slotted head. <laughs> Because these are countersink screws, I can't just grind that off and start again, and there'd be no head left. So I'll keep looking for something. This little earth screw in this uh, metal box, so some kind of electrical enclosure. Hey. That will be perfect. But there's only one of them, so that does push me into the idea of uh, a one-piece handle. Brass pins here, or brass rod in various diameters. So I shall forge this roughly to shape. The thing that I want to do with the forging is to hammer in the bevels and also make a distal taper. So the whole thing has to be flattened out because this spine is way too thick at the moment. So I'll take the whole spine down to well down to match this one. And then Put in a distal taper, which is the taper that comes down that way towards the point. But before I do any of that, I'm going to kneel it. So that just means sticking it in the forge, heating it up until it's a nice bright orange, uh, critical temperature, and then just leaving it, turning the forge off, just leaving it in there, in the warm for a few hours. Now take all the stresses out of the out of the file before I pump a load more stresses in with <laughs> the forging. While the forge is warming up, we can start looking for some wood to make the handle. So here in Woodworking Corner, I've smashed a whole load of stuff under the bench. So I'm thinking properly, a piece of oak. What I'm going to aim for is something very similar to this, but without this lump here, so it just goes, you know, there'll be a, a dip in that bit where the blade folds to. It's a lot straighter than theirs, but I think that'll be alright. So I need to round off this bit and then we'll be able to work out where that pin's got to go and I can cut a slot and everything else. I can't decide if I'm overcomplicating it by trying to do it in one, out of one piece or simplifying it. I guess we'll find out. Yes, let's drill that first, make sure it's, yeah, and then take those edges off. That's the basic shape roughed into the handle. Three or four mil thicker than it wants to be, but that's fine. We'll shave that down in a bit. Important thing now is to cut a slot right in the middle, but by leaving that slightly wide, I've given myself a bit of wiggle room. And by going down both sides, we'll end up with a, a line in the middle. That makes sense. I'll start that way around. And 
and that's now got the ability to pinch up a bit when I do up the pivot um, but enough room yeah that should all work out so far so good so the next thing to do is to suss out where the stop pin is going to go that's this point here and this is what I'm going to make it out of this 4mm brass rod and you can see how important it is because that's the stop point for the opening of the blade and then it's your hand pushing against this and turning against that that holds, it, holds the blade secure when it's open. Major cock up. I had the handle the wrong way up when I marked it out. Uh, it's obvious. <laughs> obvious now. So I marked it out with the handle this way up and that's completely wrong. So that yeah you can even see where I've marked it, where the blade goes so I've got no excuse. That hole should be about there. Uh, right start again then. The holes are drilled correctly. Now I've got to cut that slot all over again. So this time when I've cut it, I've gone slightly off of centre when I've um, and that was enlarging the saw cut, I think, with the um, drywall saw. But that's okay because this is still wider than it needs to be. So it just means when I come to shape it next, I'll take more off of this side than this one and it'll all be okay. I'm going to put the brass stop pin in now. I'm going to glue it in place. Um, so I'm going to scratch this up on its side. It's just a, there won't be very much for, for the glue to grip, but it'll be enough, I think. So we'll get the pin in and I'll make the pin somewhat oversized. Then in the next shaping bit, it will just sand that pin flush with the um, handle and all look nice. Yeah, there we go. What I'm going to do is, I'm not going to do that much forging to it, but what I do want to do is to hammer in the bevels reduce the width of this spine somewhat so there's less grinding to do and most importantly get a distal taper so a taper down this way towards the point down again I'll do that normalization another two times it's just good practice to get as much of the stresses out of the metal as possible before going in for the heat treat it's I find a lot less likely to take on a twist or a bend when you heat treat it next up is some careful cutting out so I've got the the distal taper that I was after going down there I've also thinned down most of the spine as well so there won't be so much grinding to do and I've forged in the bevels I've actually done it <laughs> quite a bit more than I would normally um, that was just because I had to bring this metal out a bit to get to the the width that I was after right, so I'm going to ignore this little bit here where it sticks up because what I'm going to do is cut this out now I'm going to cut it with a, an extended tail that I'm then going to roll up that way or that way I think I, yeah I'm gonna roll it up that way 
So the idea is it'll protrude slightly above the handle when, and it'll just be something to push into your palm when you're gripping it. Just a bit more positive grip then. Well, you couldn't do that before kneeling. <laughs> okay, let's cut out the rest. Let that cool down slowly and in the meantime do a bit of work to this. That epoxy's gone off now. So I can start to work towards the final shape with this. Um, yeah so remember it's slightly wider on this side than this side so I'm going to sort that out now. The next thing to do is to make the mechanism actually work. Then I'll heat treat the knife, so actually harden it, temper it, and then it's ready for putting the final edge on and um, we'll be done. <laughs> the other thing is I need to keep this blade under three inches on the cutting edge. That's important. Just under three inches, so that's spot on as it is. If I Keep this under three inches on the cutting edge and it's a folding non-locking knife then it's legal to carry it in my pocket. Unlike this one incidentally the fact that this one here has a locking ring that makes it illegal to carry in my pocket. Them's the rules. So it just needs opening up. A tiny bit. I think we're hitting the pin. <laughs> We're hitting the pin too soon, that's not closing up properly. So that's as far as it goes at the moment. It's, it's not uncomfortable, but it's, yeah, it's not right either. <laughs> Normally when I'm making a knife it's all about aesthetics and ergonomics but this time there's a there's a mechanism a very very simple mechanism but it does require quite a different approach okay so that goes there so technically I don't even need that pin because that's a stop in that direction and that's a stop in that direction. I mean the pin's a good idea because the, the wood 
wouldn't isn't as well it's not a pin it's not a metal pin but yes it's not essential You can tell if a steel is actually, if the heat treats worked, by the sound of it. So, that's the sound of a file on mild steel, so it's biting into that surface. <laughs> that's the sound of a file just skating off it. So you can see there, it's, it's not, yeah, not touching it. Excellent. So there's still a bit of heat now. What I'm waiting for is for it to get down to room temperature and it will all have settled down into its hardened state. Then I'm going to temper it because at the moment it's at maximum hardness but also maximum brittleness. So if I drop this on the floor, it's not unlikely it will just shatter in, <laughs> in several pieces, which would be most upsetting. But more importantly, it's useless as a knife blade at the moment. So I'm going to temper it. And I'm going to put it in the kitchen oven for two sessions of an hour each at 230 degrees because that's as high as the oven goes and that will just take that hardness take the edge off that hardness in effect and make it from a well a shard <laughs> into into an actual knife blade here it is after tempering it looks completely the same <laughs> it's still nice and straight <laughs> One twenty grit scratches in there at the moment. This is one eighty on here. So that's the four hundred grit. And that's it. I do like I've got a tiny bit of the file serrations still in the in the surface. There's a it's an edge to it but I yeah I won't sharpen it yet I'll put it all together first. And this is the whole point of a friction folder, is that you can adjust the tension in that screw so that it stays shut but opens easy. So I will give this a few more coats of linseed oil, but for now I'm just going to wipe off the excess so that we can sharpen this. So we started off looking at this picture and one of my carving knives and we've ended up with this <laughs> which is you can see where it's come from but it is it's it's his own thing as well and I tell you what I really like it it's 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 one of the best knives I've ever made when it's um, fully open like that and you grip it it's properly locked in place there's no shifting that and I think for things like carving so when I'm carving I tend to hold the the knife right up there it's just perfect for that because again you're gripping against the tang and it's just locked in place 
But also it occurs to me if you're doing cutting tasks like just chopping a piece of cheese or something, you'd be holding it like that with your thumb over the tang and again it's just completely secure. And yet it folds away. I mean yes you've got a protruding tang there so it doesn't fold away as neatly as uh, most folding knives. But I think if I can stick that in my pocket like, like that, I don't think that's going to be an issue. And when you pull it out, it's actually deployable one-handed. This is a feature I do really like about it, just being able to open it like that. You can put it away again, it's a slightly more awkward, but opening it, that really is quite nifty. Well, I think you can guess my verdicts on this project. I'm absolutely chuffed to bits with it. I think this came out really well, and I think this will actually just be a really useful everyday knife. If you fancy doing something similar to this, you can just get hold of these Ford. It's, they're really cheap. I mean, like 20, 20 pounds, 20 dollars, something along, along those lines. And just replace the scales, well, do whatever you like with it. It's, it's cheap enough to experiment with and you can end up with something quite similar to this. So this is definitely going on the hike. Um, well, they all are. <laughs> so that's the fourth and final project completed. Uh, it just remains to actually pack up, pack all my stuff in that bag I made, and, um, and head off. Yeah. <laughs> Out of the things that I've made, um, I think two of them I'm really happy with, the, uh, the pack, and this knife. The candle lantern, I really enjoyed making it, but as soon as I'd finished it, I came up with a, an idea for a better design uh, uh, for a candle lantern, which maybe I'll make that one day, but I'll just be thinking of that better design every time I use that candle lantern. But it is a sweet little thing in itself. The tent, <laughs> the, yeah, we shall see. If I, can, if I can manage to carry it, it'll be fine. Anyway, that's it for now. I'll see you next time. Cheers.